uh, Estef is a PhD student uh, at McGill University in the lab of uh, Bratislav Misic. Uh, she's got an actually really uh, amazing background. Um, she went to university in uh, Colombia, uh, the country, um, and before uh, doing some, uh, I, correct me if I'm wrong here, Steph, a master's in is it electrical engineering in Florida? Um, uh, industrial, but my hmm. bachelor's is mechanical. <laughs> right, thank you. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then she landed here at McGill for her PhD, um, where, and uh, she is an expert in many, many domains, but one of those is machine learning. <laughs> Um, and here she's been, she's kind enough to uh, give us a nice introductory lecture um, with her signature amazing slides and visualizations. <clears throat> and um, following that, uh, we'll do a lecture, uh, a, a workshop where we kind of put the lessons that you learn here in her slides um, into a practical context. Uh, so with that, I will let Steph get moving. Uh, thanks for, thanks for being here. Now, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I'm not an expert in machine learning, but I'll do my best like, to introduce you to the topic. Um, so uh, this is gonna be an introduction. It's gonna be very brief. Uh, I'll try to explain as much as I can. Um, I know Philip and Jake are gonna be there. So if you have any questions, just type it in the chat room and they will like, please feel free to interrupt me at any time. So, okay. so. Um, let's start by defining what is machine learning. So we human beings have been designed to learn from experience. On the other hand, we have computers and machines which we have designed to follow instructions, right? So the question is, can we create machines that learn from experience as we humans do? And this is where machine learning um, falls into place. So machine learning is nothing more than a fancy umbrella term that covers a set of statistical models that um, in make inference and learn from data. Okay, so before we start, um, I wanna uh, make sure that we uh, are familiar with some um, basic terminology. So in the case of me as a neuroscientist and maybe as, as it is for you, uh, we usually uh, are encountered with this situation in which we have several features, uh, let's say about the brain, it could be cortical thickness, structural connectivity, functional connectivity. Uh, so for each of these variables or columns here, we have different observations across subjects let's say, and then we want to use these variables to predict, uh, for instance, behavioral, um, behavioral information um, about humans or whatever. So in the machine learning, um, these um, variables are better known as features, and the variable that we want to predict is, uh, are better known as labels. So from now on, we're gonna refer to this matrix of samples or observations by features as our matrix X. And we're gonna refer to this vector of, of the target uh, variable that we want to predict as our Y variable. Okay, so there are two main types of, or let's say three main types of, ty of machine learning uh, algorithms or paradigms, learning paradigms. So the first one is known as supervised learning. So in a supervised learning paradigm, what we want to do is to learn a function um, f to map x to y, meaning we want to use uh, find a function such that we can use the, the data in our matrix um, x to predict the values in our vector y. So in a supervised learning, we usually have these two things. So as I already said, we want to find uh, a function such that we can map X to Y. On the other hand, we have unsupervised learning. And in unsupervised learning, the, the, the objective is not so much to predict data, but rather to create a useful representation of our data. And in unsupervised learning, we usually do not have our vector Y. We, we only have our matrix um, of data X. So under unsupervised learning, we are going to transform our data in such a way that it is more easy, that it can be more easily visualized. There is a third uh, type, which is semi-supervised learning, which is kind of in between the two. Uh, so in semi-supervised learning, we have um, labeled data, meaning we have X and Y, but we also have unlabeled data. But we're 
like for this um, uh, for this specific lecture, we're just going to focus on these two. Now, within the field of supervised learning, depending on the nature of the variable y that we want to predict, uh, whether it is a discrete or categorical value, or if it is a continuous, we can talk about classification models or regression models. On the other hand, for unsupervised learning, we have clustering uh, models and other uh, subtypes which are called dimensionality reduction um, models. Uh, so on the first part of the presentation, we're going to focus on supervised learning and we're going to start with regression. So let's say, for instance, that you are a real estate investor and you want to you go out there and you, you want to find the price of a house that, best, that gets you the best benefit. So you go out there and you collect like different features about houses, let's say the size of a house, the number of rooms of a house, and for each of these data points, you're gonna get the price, right? So now the question is, if I have a new house, a new observation, how can I predict the price? So this is where uh, we use machine learning. So for this particular problem, let's say we have two potential, we have many options, but two of them are, let's say we want to feed a linear model. Um, so in this case, uh, this model has two parameters, which are A and B, but we can go maybe a little bit fancier and feed a polynomial function. So in this case, this type of function or model that we want to feed has three parameters, A, B, A, C. So what we do with machine learning uh, in general is we take our data and we train our model in such a way that we're able to learn the estimates of A and B or in general the parameters of our model such that, the, that we reduce the, 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 the difference between the predicted values and the empirical data that we have. So at the end, learning the parameters of a model or estimating the parameter of a model becomes an optimization problem where we want to minimize the error. So how do we do that? So a typical machine learning pipeline, uh, in the first step, what we need to do is, this is very important to get familiar with your data. It's important that you play around with your data. Uh, I believe that before this lecture, you already had a lecture on this topic. Um, so I won't go uh, into detail, but uh, things that you do in data exploration and like identify outliers or um, identify that uh, the scale of your variables, sometimes it's, it's very important that all of the variables are around the same scale. Um, well, there are a lot of things that you can do, but that's not, we're not gonna focus on that. So we got the a quick next question? step, yes. Uh, so what if we have many features and it's difficult to determine whether to use linear versus polynomial model? Right. Uh, so we're going to talk about later about how to choose the different models, right? Um, it, uh, the type of model, I mean, it kind of depends on the amount of features because if you don't have many features, uh, you don't want to use a very complex model. You would rather go for simpler models. But I will try to answer that question later in the presentation. And if it's not it's still maybe very clear at the end, maybe we can discuss about it more. Is, uh, is that okay? Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So after we explore our data, the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to randomly split our data into a training set and a test set. So this process of dividing the data into a training set and a test set is usually called cross-validation. And cross-validation is nothing more than a model validation technique um, that helps us assess the generalizability power of our model, meaning how well our model is able to predict data that it has never seen, or a, an independent data set compared to the data set we used to train it with. So, okay, so the first step is we divide our data set into a training set and a test set, and then we're going to use the training, uh, the, the data in our training set to find or to estimate the parameters of our model. And at the end, we're gonna end up with, a, with what we call like a train model. The next step would be to validate our model. And to do the validation is where we're gonna use our test set. And this is very important because the test set is the last 
So we initially split our data into training and tested, and we, from the beginning, we completely forgot about the test set. The test set only comes at the very end. So let's start with this section of the, of the pipeline, which is called the model feeding. So when, you, when we're trying to feed a model, there are certain elements that always appear there. So the first one is, well, again, I wanna repeat, this is very important. We, the first, first step, we, we divide our data into a training and a test. So in that case, we get an X train, Y train, and an X test, Y test. So this, the, second, the first element that we have to define is the type of function that we're going to feed. Uh, in this case, let's say we're going to feed the linear function. So in the case of a linear function, we only have two parameters, the slope of the, of the line and the intercept. The second uh, element that we need to define is the loss function. So in a regression problem, um, most of the times where the more commonly used uh, loss function is the mean square error, which is the square sum of the, of the errors, basically. And the errors are this, is the difference between our data points and, and our predictions. Uh, Jake, I have a question. Do you see my, the mouse when it moves? Yes, we do. Oh, okay, perfect. Okay, so the third thing, uh, third thing that we need to define, okay, it's very important to understand that the loss function is is a function of the parameters of the model, right? Okay, and the last element that we need to uh, define is how we're going to optimize that loss. So the, we want to minimize the loss function, we want to minimize the error. And the most commonly used uh, optimization algorithm is called grading this. So let's go uh, a bit more in detail. Okay, so okay, this is basically what I just said. So we have our loss function and we're gonna use gradient descent to navigate through that loss function in such a way that we find the minimum. So I'm gonna go in detail through each of these uh, three elements. So let's start with the, with the model selection. So if we're talking about regression, um, there are different options out there, different types of functions that we can fit. We can fit a linear regression, like a linear function, um, we can get fancier and feed a polynomial, or we can go even more fancier and use artificial neural networks. Um, again, it, it really depends on the problem at hand, uh, but what I would suggest from personal experience, always start from the simplest and, and then go to more complex models. But uh, but most of the times linear regression seems to be uh, uh, good enough. I think that mostly uh, to, to be able to have a good uh, performance in more complex model, I think it's really important that uh, it really depends on the amount of samples that you have. But if you have a limited, uh, again, I mean, this is, there are ways to estimate what is a limited uh, number of samples, but if the number of samples or of observations that you have is not very big, usually simpler models will do better. Okay, so that's for the model. Now, regarding the loss function, in the case of regression, we, we also have several options out there. The most famous one is the mean square error, which is the square sum of each of the errors. Uh, but there are some others like the mean absolute error, the max error, the amount of explained variance, or the R score. So once we have defined the function that we want to fit and the, and the loss function that we want to minimize, um, let me do something. Oops. And the loss function that we want to minimize. Uh, so we're going to use gradient descent to navigate through these. Um, okay, so let me explain you first. So this is um, this is the this is the loss function in the z um, component of the in the z axis, and then in the x and y axis we have the parameters a and b. So this is the loss function as a function of the parameters. So basically we want to start navigating on this, navigating on this surface uh, in such a way that as we give, um, as we take a small steps or as we take a steps, um, we're gonna get close to the minimum of that function. Now, um, 
sometimes this is um, sometimes in the case of the mean square error because it's a square function we usually have this very nice um, paraboloid uh, shape which in this case finding the minimum is very easy but our loss function is not always as nice it, uh, as this one sometimes we have uh, more convoluted uh, lost functions like this um, so this is just something to take into account which is usually this is usually what we what we have Okay, so I'm gonna explain in more detail what is gradient descent. So in gradient descent, the first thing that we need to do is to, the first step is to randomly initialize the model parameters. In this case of, uh, in the case of a linear model, we initialize the, the, the slope and the intercept. And then iteratively, we're gonna do two things. The first one is we're going to compute the loss. Now, how do we do that? So we use our training uh, data set, meaning our X uh, train, and we're going to plug that X train in this function, and then we get our predictions. And then once we have our predictions, we're going to use our Y train to estimate the loss function. Once we have our loss function, uh, we can um, basically, once we so for a set of parameters a and b we estimate the value on the surface of the loss function and then at that point we're going to find the gradient of that function and the gradient is nothing more uh, than the slope or the direction of maximum change of that surface uh, so at every iteration of the gradient descent we're going to give steps in the direction opposite to the gradient in such a way that we uh, minimize the value of our loss function. Now in the gradient descent, um, it, the initial steps is, uh, are larger, but as we get, the, um, as we increase the number of iterations, um, the, the size of the step that, that we give uh, becomes smaller. And so that's uh, very briefly what gradient descent is. Um, I just want to remind you that the, this, again, this is very important the data that we use to find the parameters A and B is the training, uh, the training data. Okay, so everything we talk about so far is the model feeding section. Once we have our model, we want to validate how well it performs, how well it predicts. So, so okay, so in the model validation uh, part, we have, we have already find our parameters A and B. So we're gonna use our test uh, data set and we're gonna plug our X test in this function and then we're gonna get a set of predictions. And then we're gonna compare this set of predictions with our Y test. So we have our two vectors and then there are uh, different square functions out there that you can use. It does not necessarily have to be the same as the loss function. It can be, but um, you can use different square functions to, to measure the performance of your model. Okay, so I just wanna make sure that every, everything is clear uh, until here. I don't know if there are more questions. Seems no questions no thus questions. far. Okay. So let's continue. Oh, wait, no, sorry, we do have a uh, question. Yep. Yeah. How do you know you're not in a local min minimum? Yeah, so um, it could happen. It could happen that you get trapped in a local minimum. So that's why it is usually common to run different iterations um, of the. Um, of the of the algorithm so you know depending on where you initialize on when you your initial point on the surface uh you might get trapped in different local minimum that's uh so for for this one way to avoid this is to initialize at very random positions in that surface meaning giving random initial values to a and b that is one way Um, I, okay, Jake. Sorry. Uh, yep. So um, the gradient descent doesn't go through every point on the surface. It seems very time complex to find the global minimum. Yeah, no, no. It does not guarantee that you will, will find the, the global minimum. There's no way. Uh, 
to guarantee that you you will find the global minimum. Okay, cool. I think we can move on. You guys, if you have questions, just put them in the chat and I'll, I'll oh, wait. When should we use one score function over another? Um, I guess it really depends. So for example, um, yeah, I guess it really depends because different score fun functions tell you different things about your predictions. So for instance, let's say if you want to use, um, I, I think it, it, it really depends on, on, the, on what you want to do. But uh, for the case of regression, um, as far as I can remember, there's not a preferred measure over the other. Uh, usually in general, they all work. It, it, it really depends mostly on what you want to do. But on the case of classification, we're going to see later, it is, uh, there are some measures that work better than others. But in the case of regression, uh, regression, as far as I can, like, I can remember, I don't see uh, cases where we would use one over the other, at least not that I, that come to my mind right, right now. If I, could try. If, if I may ahead, say, uh, it just uh, it also depends on the nature of the distribution of your data. For instance, the, uh, the, the, uh, the square loss is uh, well adapted when your data are uh, Gaussians. Uh, so it, it, it depends on, on that uh, distribution as well. For, it also depends, of course, as you said, like on the, on the nature of what you want to, uh, uh, to, to predict and to do. But the, uh, the distribution of the data is an important aspect in, this, uh, in, in, in choosing the loss. Okay. But, uh, okay, but I guess that um, what uh, uh, JP just said, I think it is um, very important, especially for the loss function, right? But when it comes to evaluating the predictions, well, I, I guess as well, yeah. Okay, so if there are no more questions, uh, we can continue, right, Jake? Yeah, go for it. Okay. So, okay, so we validate our model. So the next step, uh, or not the next step. So everything is nice until here, like we have our grading descent, and I already mentioned if our loss function has this very nice uh, parabolo parabolic uh, shape, uh, we will usually find the minimum. But as uh, some of you already mentioned, that's not always um, the case. Uh, like um, you might have very convoluted uh, loss surfaces uh, where you have multiple local minima. So how do you deal? How do you deal with that? So uh, for that, there is another. Uh, so initially, we talk about dividing the, the the data into a training set and a test set. But now, taking our training data set, we're going to further divide that data set into a, a smaller training data set and a validation data set. And we're going to perform multiple training epochs. So we're going to use our training data and we're going to pass it through the algorithm several times until we get closer to, to the minimum. But then the question becomes like how many training epochs, meaning how many times I can pass the training data through the algorithm. Because you could think I could do this infinitely and I will perfectly feel, fit the model, but that's not really the answer. So let's just keep this in mind, like how many, this question in mind, how many training epochs uh, should we perform? And I'll come back to this later. So um, going back to the, uh, general machine learning pipeline. There is something called, so we already talked about cross-validation, which is this idea of testing our model in using an out of sample uh, data set. But now there's something um, more, uh, a bit more complex, which is called k-fold cross-validation. So why should we, I will explain in a minute, what is k-fold cross-validation. Uh, but basically what you do is you're going to pull a set of predictions over different partitions of your data set. You're, so you're going to partition your data into a training set and a test set uh, multiple times. But why, does, why is it um, that 
why is k fold cross validation um, important? So the first thing is it will help us avoid overfitting, and that's a, a concept I will talk about um, in a second. Uh, it will also help us improve the general generalizability of the model, meaning the 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 ability of the model to predict data that it has not um, that data that it has not seen um, before, and then. Also, uh, key fold cross validation is used to provide a more accurate uh, measure of, of the performance of your model. And it is also very useful for hyperparameter tuning. So let's see what is key fold cross validation. So as I said at the beginning, we have all our data and we divide it into a training set and a test set. But now we're going to further divide the training uh, data into a smaller uh, data set. So as I mentioned at the beginning, we split our data in training tests and you completely forgot, forget for now about your test set. So now we're going to do different subdivisions of our smaller training data set. So each of these smaller subdivision is called a fold. So for every subdivision, you have your training data and you have like a temporal test data test uh, data set that we're going to call a validation set. So for every of these different data partitions, you're going to perform multiple training epochs. And then it's still the question of how many training epochs we should do. Uh, still, we have not answered that question yet, but for each of these different data partitions, you're going to use it for uh, integrating these an algorithm through uh, through different training epochs. And once you have done that uh, for all of your data partitions, what you're going to do is, okay, so in each of these partitions, sure, you train your model on the training set, then you evaluate uh, training with the validation set. And then once you have done this across all the folds, you're going to report how your model perform, uh, performs on the test set. Only at the very end, when you're going to report uh, the performance of your model, you're going to use your test set. You should never introduce your test set during training. That's very important to keep in mind. Okay, I also mentioned that uh, key fold cross validation is very useful for hyperparameter tuning. So what is a hyperparameter. So usually a hyperparameter is a parameter of the model that is set at the beginning, like is set before you train your model. So it doesn't actually change um, as we train the model. You just set the hyperparameter at the beginning and then you, you just train your model. And it's usually, usually that hyperparameters are used to control learning itself. So what you can do is you can perform multiple rounds of key fold cross validation using different hyperparameters. And at the end, you choose those hyperparameters that uh, give you the better predictions. And then when you have chosen that, those set of hyperparameters is when you can use your test data to report the, um, the performance of your model. So is there any question on key fold cross validation? Uh, maybe just one. Can you give uh, one example of a, a hyperparameter, for instance? Uh, I mean, can you just uh, uh, give one example? Yeah. So, for example, um, so this is um, the okay. So I don't know if you remember when I was explaining the grading vision algorithm. Um, uh, no, wait. Actually, let me think. We'll go over some of the examples of this also in the workshop. Yeah. Okay. That's great. Yeah. I mean, one, one example is, for, for instance, if you have like a, some uh, regularization aspect and you, you need to regularize with some function, uh, in, like uh, you, would, uh, you would have to choose the regularization uh, of the, uh, but, that, but, but let's, uh, let's uh, postpone that uh, discussion until uh, for after uh, when uh, Jake is going to show that. Right. Uh, and if I remember when I go through regularization, I'll show you what exactly is a hyperparameter. Because, yeah, you're right. 
So quick other question. So after running k-fold cross-validation to tune the hyperparameters, do we mm -hmm. then train the model once on the entire training set and test that trained model on the test set? Mm, that's a good question, uh, but I would say um, I'd, I'd say generally the cross validation is important for determining the, the best parameters for your model. And then um, it is better to use as much data as possible after that. So you would then use the parameters you've defined in using cross validation and apply that, uh, <clears throat> apply those parameters um, to the test data. Yeah, I mean, I guess, uh using cross-validation has the advantage that you're not always training with the same data samples. Whereas if you just do one, one single, um, like whole training set, uh, I, I guess it's better to use always the cross-validation part. I think we, we can also, we'll have a little session on Friday with a, a specific uh, aspect of, of those things uh, that uh, we, we will be able to answer. So if, if there are like a little bit uh, advanced questions, we will, uh, we will uh, sh uh, answer those on uh, Friday afternoon. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay, so let's continue. So I talked to you about uh, before this concept of overfeeding. So as, let's assume we are in our cave fold, um, in our cave fold uh, round. So I told you for each of these folds, um, okay, so, let, so uh, here's where I'll bring back the question of how many training epochs uh, should we perform? So for these, in each of your cave folds, you're gonna uh, monitor your loss function um, with your training set, but you will also um, monitor your loss function with your validation set. So for every k you have your training set and your validation set. So you have these curves or, of how uh, your loss function is evolving as you increase the number of training epochs. And the question is, where should we stop? And basically, because as you can see, there is like an, an optimal, um, Point, there is this sweet point here that tells you so exactly when your uh, loss function um, it starts increasing on the validation set that's where you should stop your training otherwise you will um, overfeed your model to that specific uh, training data set so if you use less training epochs then you're on, on in an underfeeding scenario uh, and if you uh, keep increasing the number of training epochs, you will see that the loss function will uh, obviously on the training set go to zero just because you are using the same data to keep optimizing the parameters of your model to the point that it will perfectly fit your data. But then uh, if you check that on an independent uh, data set, you will see how uh, your loss function will it will not generalize as well. So when that happens, you're in an overfeeding scenario. So the, the question to how many training epochs you should perform is basically uh, when your validation, when your loss uh, on your validation set starts increasing. Now, uh, there's always in machine learning this concept of the bias variance trade-off that is very uh, related to what I was just saying before. So, um, just to illustrate better what we mean by the bias va variance trade-off, um, so let's see in an, in an underfeeding scenario, um, we have a high bias, meaning that we are very, uh, that we are kind of far from the target, uh, whereas in the overfitting scenario, when, uh, when our model uh, perfectly fits all our data points, uh, we are kind of, um, we're still, we're farther from the target, but our vari variance is increased. So in the underfitting, underfitting scenario, we have a high bias, meaning we are far from the target, but we have a very low variance. Like most of our estimates will, 
uh, will be always uh, be closed. Whereas in an overfeeding scenario, we will have a higher barrier, uh, bias, meaning that we're far from the target, but our variance um, is going to be, um, is going to be, um, sorry, in an overfeeding scenario, the bias is going to be less. So we're going to be closer to the target, but the variance is going to be larger. So there is always this optimal point, um, which is what we're trying to look, which is uh, where there is a perfect trade-off between these bias and variance, and is uh, this point coincides uh, precisely with, with this point here. So there's always, when we are playing with the number of training epochs, we're, we're balancing these two, we're making a trade-off between these two things. So uh, this bias, bias variance trade-off can also be seen uh, with respect to the complexity of the model. So uh, as you choose a more complex model, meaning that you have more parameters to fit, is because you will kind of be able to better fit your data. So there's also um, a trade-off there, and it's the same bias variance trade-off. So as you increase the complexity of your model, meaning the, the number of features that you're trying to, to fit, to use in your model, you're also um, playing with the same uh, trade-off. So as you increase the model complexity, your bias is gonna decrease, but the variance is gonna increase. So again, if you use a very simple model, you're in an underfeeding scenario, but if you, uh, on the other hand, if you use a very complex model, you're in a overfeeding scenario. So we only want to be like somewhere here in between. Okay, so um, going back to the typical machine learning pipeline, um, there is this, uh, there are some tips that we can use to improve our models. So one of those uh, tips is dimensionality, to use dimensionality reduction techniques. So um, the, the place where, um, the, the point in the pipeline where we would place this dimensionality reduction techniques is right before the optimization of the parameters of the model, but after we have divided our training, uh, our data set into a training and a test set. So why do we use dimensionality reduction? So one, uh, one first reason is because we have what is called or what is known as the course of dimensionality, which is when we, are, we have more features uh, than observations. The other reason is because um, the actual intrinsic dimension of your data can be actually uh, be small, meaning that you have redundant data. Uh, also, uh, you want to be able to mainly use the, the most uh, salient features for the training of your model, and you want to be able to remove as much noise as you can, uh, noisy features as you can. So let's go, yeah, another, import, uh, another reason why dimensionality reduction is important is because it also helps to visualize your data better. So, I'm going to go very briefly uh, through what is dimensionality reduction. So there are two, two types of dimensionality reduction. One is feature extraction or engineering, which is where you, you create, um, you actually transform uh, your features into a new set of features. So here you create a compact representation of your data, but um, and as always, because we are talking about dimensionality re reduction, you are mapping your input feature into a lower dimensional space. So for instance, if I we have our feature, uh, our set uh, X of features, X1, X2, X3, we're gonna create a new feature, which is gonna be only one dimension, for example, but it's gonna be a, a combination of the other features. So in feature extraction or feature engineering, you're usually, um, transforming your initial features. The other option is to do feature selection. So you keep your original features, but you're just gonna select uh, a subset of those features. So 
so yeah, as what I said, the features are still in the original space. So for, for example, your new set of features Z is gonna be a subset of the initial set of features, but they're still, um, you haven't changed, um, you haven't transformed them. Now, uh, we can keep uh, going deeper in each of these uh, things. So there are different types of feature extraction um, techniques. So for instance, you have linear feature extraction and in this, um, in this sub section, you have principal component analysis, independent component analysis, um, and some others. And on the nonlinear side, you have something called isomap, T's and E, self-organizing maps, etc. This is just to give you an idea of, uh, of the techniques. Uh, and on the feature selection, you, you can also go deeper into this part. And so there are different things. One is variable selection. So if you're talking, so for instance, if you're in linear regression, you can use the T statistic to only select um, certain, a certain set of variables, or um, uh, there's something called mean redundancy, max relevancy. Uh, that's a way of selecting a subset of features. And there are other criteria, uh, such as consistency or the Bayesian, um, I don't remember, um, criterion. Uh, well, but this is just to give you an idea of all the techniques that are out there. We're not gonna go um, in, in detail. Okay, so uh, dimensionality reduction is one way in which you can improve your model. There is a, diff there's a second tip in which you can improve your model and is using regularization. So basically regularization consists on putting penalties on the loss function to prevent overfitting. So there are two um, main classes of regularization. So you use this when you want to prevent overfitting, which is like when you are perfectly um, fitting your data. So one such type of regularization is lasso, uh, which basically constrains your your parameters to be as far. So when you, imp so this is the parameter here. This is the uh, penalty on the loss function, let's say on the mean square error. So this lambda is one of the hyper parameters of this type of function. Uh, so this is what uh, JP was um, talking about earlier. So this uh, lambda here is uh, a hyper parameter that you have to set before you start um, training your model. Uh, so in, in a sparse or lasso uh, regularization, what you're doing is that you are forcing uh, these, some of the coefficients or some of the parameters to be zero. So in this case, so if you, deal, if you force these uh, higher order terms to zero, then you will have a, a simpler model. So the other type of regularization is called rich, re, uh, rich um, regularization, which rather than um, forcing your parameters to be zero, it just uh, decreases them, just makes them smaller. So it kind of smooths your function. Uh, and again, is a penalty on the, on the loss function. Steph, we had a comment earlier and, and mm -hmm. maybe you could comment on it. Uh, so the comment is K-full cross-validation is not always computationally efficient in both time and space. Therefore, I recommend to simply shuffle your data set to avoid that you tra that your training data be overfitted if the k-fold is not possible. We have a different question after that. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, like I kind of, I mean, like uh, I think you're just shuffling the same that I said. You, what do you mean uh, by shuffling? Do you mean like? Uh, shuffling the uh the rows or, or uh, i'm not too sure is it like a, you mean resampling the data set uh, i'm not too sure what reshuffle means in this uh, uh in this setting it says yes rows uh if i mean shuffling the rows i mean re, re uh, reordering the rows will uh, in general not uh uh, not uh, change, uh, you know, like uh, the uh, the um, uh, the prediction. Like you, you, you're still trying to predict uh, one specific value of the y, 
uh, with the specific value of the x on the same row. So if your if your rows are independent, that's not going to change your uh, your your prediction. So I, don't, I think it doesn't apply. But let's move on and let's uh, let's uh, keep keep please keep all your questions. Uh, I'm sure there will be many. Uh, we'll uh, we'll go over those uh, like in this afternoon and also tomorrow afternoon. Oh, well, we actually some we we got plenty of time actually, and we have some pretty uh, important I think uh, basic questions that it should be pretty quick here. Um, okay. Just one of them is, um, uh, is the feature the same thing as a parameter? No. <laughs> so the features, um, I don't know if you remember one of the first slides I explained. The features are the variables um, that you're using to predict. So the, your features are these x and the parameters are in this case uh, the coefficients. It depends, it depends on the model that you choose, on the function that you choose to fit but the features is your observations basically it's features refers to all the different variables that you're using to predict yeah and one more quick question um when it says can l2 constrain uh, constraints parameters to be small uh, what, what is it what does it mean by by small or smaller it just gives a literally uh it gives less weight to certain uh, uh parameters so so in lasso, what happens typically is that uh, the, the coefficients or certain parameters will be zero, completely zero. Whereas in a rich, rich is a bit more flexible. It does not completely put them to zero. It just decreases the weight on, of that parameter. I don't know okay, if thanks. that's clear enough. Okay. Okay. So there is a third tip that we can use, which is called ensemble methods. And basically in ensemble, ensemble methods, what you use is you, you train different models and then you use, uh, you train different models and you predict with each of those models. And at the end, you average uh, the predictions across models to give a better estimate of your predictions. So one type of ensemble methods that uh, we have is bagging, which is, um, a con like a contraction for bootstrap resampling plus ag aggregation. So uh, what, we, what we have uh, in a bagging a scenario is we take different bootstrap samples. So bootstrap resampling is a resampling technique uh, in which you sample your data points with replacement. So you create, you, you have your training data set you do a bootstrap resampling, meaning you have different data sets of the same size, but um, you just sample with replacement each of those. And then you use these uh, new samples to train the model. So you have this um, sub uh, subsample here or resample uh, here and you train your model and you do this uh, many times in parallel. And at the end, you use each of these models to get a prediction uh, and then you average across the models and then you get a new prediction. So usually each of these are like weaker um, models, but when you combine them together, uh, it gives you usually a better, uh, better estimate of, of your variable. And then at the end, once you have trained all your, all your models in parallel, you're gonna use your test set to report the performance of your ensemble model. So that's bagging. There's another technique, uh, which is more like a, so bagging is more like in a parallel uh, fashion, you train your models, but boosting is more like a sequential type of, of ensemble method. So what you do is you take your training data and you take, a, you train a model, and then you use the, somehow the results of the trained model to train a second model. And then you take the results of the second model to train a third model, to train a third model and so on and so forth. So at the end, you're not averaging, you're just like kind of improving the step-by-step -step your model. And, and then at the end, again, when you have done this sequentially, uh, you use your test set to report the performance of your ensemble method. We have a question. When would, you, when would we use cross-validation versus bootstrap? Uh, these are very different things. So you can combine them actually, because you can think of each of this model, um, as a single model. So you can do cross validation on this one and report uh, a prediction 
and you can do the same thing with each of these and at the end you get the average or um, I mean they're not mutually exclusive you can actually combine them great thanks mm -hmm. okay uh, okay so there are different sources of bias when you're applying machine learning so one of them uh, it's known as key hacking, which is like, for example, if you're applying a key fold cross validation, you can, there's no way uh, to decide what is the best number of folds that you use for uh, key fold cross validation. So what you should not do is to try different, um, different number of folds and then only report the best. So what you should do instead is, for example, you pick uh, k uh, as equal 10 and then repeat as many times for, uh, at least uh, more than 200 times or as many as you can and then report the full distribution that would be the right thing to do there is a different uh, there is another source of bias which is called metric hacking which is you choose different performance metrics so you can use the accuracy f1 where these are mostly for classification which we will see later but you, you run your model, you train your model, and then you use different uh, metric measures, and then you only report the best. So what you should do instead is shoot the most appropriate, appropriate and recognized metric for the problem. So as we mentioned before, the type of um, performance measure that you're using, uh, it mostly depends on what you want to do. So you choose that one, and then you just report on that one. There is another type, which is feature or data set hacking. So the same thing, you, you try different subsets of features or some samples of your data set, and then you only report the best. So what you should do in that case is use and report everything, all analysis and all data sets. Okay, so any question on this? I think there's still we're still on the bootstrapping thing. Are yeah. are the two oh, methods sorry. mutually exclusive? Can't you do CV on a bootstrapped data set? Can you do CV on a bootstrap? I guess. Um, sure. I mean. Yeah. I, I guess, yeah, I mean, if you want to bootstrap your data set and then run several models and do cross validation, I mean, there's, yeah, they definitely, I guess the point is they are not mutually exclusive. Yeah. So just to, just to define what is bootstrap, maybe uh, uh, bootstrap is when you, you take your uh, sample and then you draw samples from that, uh, uh, from that, ensemble, uh, from that set. Uh, so let's say you have like a hundred participants, you're just going to draw participants with uh, replacements. So I, mean, you, I can possibly, uh, you know, uh, uh, take uh, twice uh, the subject number two or uh, three times subject number five. And that's, you know, and then you do your analysis with this. And then you, when you redo this, this, uh, this analysis, you will get a sense of the viability of the result of that analysis. So whatever is the analysis that you're doing, uh, by uh, by bootstrapping, which is basically sampling from the empirical distribution of the data, uh, you will get uh, an estimate of the variance of uh, the uh, the result of your analysis. In, in this instance, it's machine learning, but it could be some uh, other analysis. You'll get a, a, an estimation of the variance of that uh, estimate, which I think is in, uh, is uh, you know what uh, bootstrap is uh, the fundamental aspect of bootstrap is doing. Mm -hmm. Um, let's see if there are more questions about this part. Uh, we have a question. How would we differentiate feature or data set hacking from feature selection in dimensionality reduction? Yeah, so, uh, so for example, if you're doing a feature selection, you would be doing feature hacking if you, uh, if after your feature selection process, like you try different feature selection process and let's say you got different uh, subsets of features. And then you would 
be doing feature hacking if you use all these different types of sub all these different subsets of features that you got from different feature selection process and then you train your model with this subset and then you just report the best one so so yeah so feature selection is the process of only selecting a subset of features but um but yeah I, is it is it clear and, um, and you can this is also a good way to illustrate the purpose of cross validation if you um select features for one fold and then you test it out on uh, in that fold and then it doesn't actually work for another fold then you can see that actually you were overfitting in that case and then you abandoned that idea i don't, I don't know if that was clear but we'll, we'll have an example of this in the workshop okay Okay, let's move, move along so we can get, finish in time, on time. Okay. So that's, well, that's basically all for regression. So we now, as a, we're, so far we've only been on this part and we talk about regression. So now we're gonna briefly talk about classification. So as I mentioned before, classification, uh, the variable that you want to predict is usually a categorical variable or um, or a discrete variable. So let's say for instance, if you have pictures of, of, of cats and dogs, at the end what you want your um, model is to tell you whether it is uh, your uh, particular data, uh, your particular sample belongs to, to which category. Okay, so again, there are different methods to perform classification. One of those is support vector machine. So in, in support vector machines, you have your data points. And then what you want to do is to find a plane or a surface that uh, maximizes the margin between classes. And so let's assume these data points belong to a class and these other data points belong to the other class. class. So you want to maximize uh, this distance here. You want to find a plane that maximizes this distance here. And what this distance here is, is the perpendicular distance of the closest point of each class to the plane that you're trying to find. Uh, now, there is another type of, uh, you can, okay, so you can also use artificial neural networks to do, to perform classification. Uh, you can also use logistic regression, uh, decision trees, which basically you buy a set of decisions uh, you start dividing your feature space into smaller sets. Um, uh, well, I, I mean, we're not going to go into detail uh, about all the different classification uh, models, but I think uh, what's um, okay. So one important thing to mention is that there are like two two types of classification models. So usually in super vector machines, uh, you will get at the end uh, whether a sample belongs to a particular category. But there are other type of classifiers where you will get like a probability of a data point to belong to different classes. Um, so I'm gonna talk briefly, speak about some performance, performance, how you can evaluate, validate your classification model when you have a binary classification problem, meaning you only have two classes. So there is this um, um, thing called the confusion matrix, which is basically um, you have uh, your predicted values on the rows and then you have the the real value of, of your data in the columns. So in, ideally what you want is all your data to fall in, your, in the diagonal of this matrix, right? So for example, if you're trying to predict whether, a, let's say in the scenario, you're trying to predict whether a person has a, a disease or not. Uh, so you want, um, you want that those that are positive, um, so sorry, those that actually have the disease, you actually predict that they have the disease and those ones that, they, that uh, are negative for that disease, you actually want to predict that, that they're negative. But then there are these other two possibilities in which you can predict that a person is positive when it is actually negative. So that's what we call false positives or type one error. 
And there is this other scenario, scenario where the person actually has the disease, but you, you predict as, as it doesn't have it, which is, uh, the, which is called false negatives or type two errors. So it, it really depends uh, which type of error you want to minimize. Um, but I would say that uh, some of the worst case scenarios is when, for example, in the medical uh, setting, in a medical setting, it would be really bad to predict that a person uh, is negative when it really has a disease. So, so depending on, on the type of error you want to, to decrease, uh, you will play with your model. I will show you how. So, okay. So there are different uh, score functions that you can use to evaluate your classification model. So there is accuracy, uh, which is like, uh, I'm not gonna go into detail to each of those, but uh, you have the, the slides. So you can see how you can estimate each of these different um, measures. What I want to measure, uh, what I want to mention, and this is actually one question that came before, is what type of a score uh, function or a score measure I should use to, to, to measure them, to validate my model. So in the case of classification, there have been uh, several studies that have shown that it's actually when you have a number, an imbalanced number of classes, meaning that you have sorry, not an imbalanced number of classes, but an imbalanced data set, meaning that you have more data points for a particular class than for an for a other one, you would rather use precision and recall in those cases. Okay. So, well, this is uh, more on the same thing. So here, I just want to mention that there are these two concepts uh, called sensitivity or recall and a specific specificity, which is the true positive rate um, and the false uh, positive rate. Uh, so I'm not gonna go into detail, but uh, take into account where those values come from. Um, I wanna talk about this, which I think it's a, a bit more important. Let me do something, okay. So these performance metrics uh, that I'm gonna talk about, the ROC curve and the precision recall curve are mainly when you have probab probabilistic classifiers, which is like when you have, um, when your classifier rather than predicting a particular category for each of your samples, it predicts um, a probability. It gives you a probability over the classes. So when you have those kind of, of classifiers, you might want to use what is called the receiver operating um, character characteristic curve, which is, um, on the y-axis, you have the, the TPR or sensitivity, which we talked about before, and the uh, false positive rate, or also known as specificity. So the, the advantage of using probabilistic classifiers is since you have a, a probability, you can play with the threshold that you, can, that you will use uh, to define whether a particular sample belongs to one class or not. So you can play with that threshold. So for different levels of threshold, you will have um, a different, there's gonna be a trade-off between these two. So, so you, for different values of that threshold at which you're gonna cut the, the probability and decide whether, it, uh, whether a sample belongs to one class or the other. Uh, so you have your ROC curve, and this is actually very useful when you're trying to define, to, to um, determine which classification model is better than other. So you can do this, you can construct the ROC curve for different classifiers and you can actually compare them. So in a very bad classifier, the, R, the way in which this ROC curve will look like, uh, it would be like a straight line here. So in a, um, uh, let me see. In a really bad classifier, your ROC curve would look something like this. Uh, but as your classifier becomes better, the ROC curve will approximate uh, something like this. So the way, like, uh, the way to estimate which model is better than the other is your, you, you, um, you estimate the area under the curve of, each R, of these um, ROC curves for every model. And the one that has the highest um, uh, area under the curve is, um, is a better model. 
Um, we also have the precision recall, um, how can I? Oh. How can I deactivate the? Okay. So the other thing is the precision recall curve. So on the y axis, um, again, you have uh, the uh, precision uh, is the same. So for uh, different values of your threshold, you're going to construct these, um, this curve. And it's, it's a similar concept as the ROC curve. Um, OK. Yeah, something that I want to say again, as with the measures in, um, in non-probabilistic classifiers, uh, that there are some ones that work better than other. If you have uh, an imbalanced uh, data set, it is better to use the precision recall curve. Otherwise you will have, if you use the ROC curve with, when you have an imbalanced data set, you will have like an optimistic scenario of your model which is something that you, when it really is not a good model. So, so yeah, so for in this case, I would say if you have an imbalanced data set, use the precision and recall curve. There is something called, uh, so before we were talking about binary classification when, when, uh, is we, when we only have two classes, but then there's also something called multi-class prediction or multi-class classification, which you should not confuse with multi-label pre label prediction. So in multi-class prediction, in contrast to binary um, classification, rather than having two classes, you have more than two. So for example, you want to predict in a set of pictures, whether it is a cat, a dog, or a bird. So, so in these cases, if you have a multi-class prediction uh, problem, then you can, what you can do is to extend the binary matrix of multi, uh, to each yeah, extend the binary metrics that we use for binary problems to multi-class problems. Uh, simply uh, treat um, each, um, each class as a collection of binary problems, basically. So, so you're, yeah, you're gonna treat each different class as if it was a binary classification problem, and then you can apply the same measures that we saw at the beginning. Um, and then if you want to have an overall estimate of your model, you can then average across all the classes, uh, any of these measures. So, okay. So I think that's all for classification. Again, it's just an introduction. I believe uh, you will go deeper in each of these topics later throughout the, the course. Okay, so, so far, everything we've talked about was supervised learning. Um, we talk about classification and regression. And now we're gonna go on the other side, which is unsupervised learning. Um, so in unsupervised learning, I mentioned we have what is uh, clustering, and then we have uh, a set of methods that are for dimensionality or reduction. So usually uh, this type of unsupervised methods, if you remember, uh, we talk about dimensionality reduction in the pipeline, uh, in a general machine learning uh, pipeline. So you can use many of these methods to transform your data before you start training your model. So I'm just going to talk about clustering and I'm just going to mention different types of algorithms. So we have k-means. So in k-means you have, remember that in unsupervised learning you don't have uh, your vector of, you don't have a target variable, you don't want to predict, you just have this, uh, few, this huge matrix of features and you just are, you want to see if there is like a hidden structure in your data or like a latent structure in your data. So with, uh, with k-means uh, um, is a type of clustering in which you partition your data, uh, your data points into different clusters. Uh, sometimes it helps uh, visualizing better um, your data set. So k-means basically is based, it assigns each data point um, depending on the distance, uh, on a distance measure um, to, so depending on the distance of each data point to the center of mass of each of the cluster. So again, k-means is an iterative algorithm. Uh, you also have hierar hierarchical clustering. Um, the advantage of hierarchical clustering is then uh, it not only gives you like, it not only partitions your data into different classes, but it also finds like somehow of hierarchical structure uh, in your data. 
And finally, uh, there is another type of clustering. I mean, these are not the only three, there are way more out there, but there is another one that is very use, uh, commonly used, which is a Gaussian mixture of models. And basically what these type of models do is to, be, uh, to fit um, a mixture of Gaussians to each of your, of your different uh, clusters of, of data. Okay, so, so this is, I think, um, with, uh, with this part, we finish the, like, uh, like, what I'm gonna talk about next is like a more general, it doesn't have to do with supervised or unsupervised, it applies to machine learning in general, and this, uh, what we're gonna talk about is actually uh, very important. So, I just wanna mention this. So, there is a difference between, <laughs> the classical statistics uh, to make inference on the current um, more modern machine learning methods that are used mainly for prediction. So uh, in a statistical inference, which is what we used to do uh, before, mostly before, I mean, we still use it, but uh, the main goal of a statistical inference was to identify significant contributing variables um, in a model. So for example, we will use hypothesis testing and p-values to decide, for instance, in a, in a linear model, which of your variables X or features um, was the one that was contributing the most to, um, to your variable, to explain your variable uh, Y. In contrast, when we use uh, this type of machine learning or pattern recognition algorithms, the, the main goal is to identify the most predictive, uh, predictive variables, which are not always not necessarily the ones that explain the most the, the Y variable. I mean, in, in either case, you can imply causality, but uh, sometimes, uh, this type of as, uh, classical statistical inference would tell us a bit more about the, the mechanisms of the process that we're trying to, to study. But in pattern recognition, we should not try to, like first of all, many of these models are black box models. So it's very hard to interpret or to see what they're doing. Uh, so it's more, uh, it's mostly for prediction purposes. Now, um, yeah, this is a bit of what, uh, what I've said. Uh, so yeah, so in pattern recognition, uh, it, it concerns less regarding like the data generating process. So if, we're, if what we want to do is to, find, to try to understand the mechanisms be behind uh, the process that generates our variable Y, uh, machine learning is not the best way to use that. So just keep that in mind. Okay, and finally, um, I wanna talk about diagnosing features or interpretability. So this uh, part here is very important, especially in medical settings where, for example, if you're using uh, machine learning to classify patients between like a disease or non-disease, uh, you, I mean, you use your machine learning, but then your machine learning algorithm to, to, to classify patients, but then the question is how much should we trust um, our, these machine learning algorithms, um, especially because we know that they are black boxes and we really don't know how they are basing their decisions, like what are they basing their decisions on. So there is this cool package called Local Interpretable Model Agnostic Explanations or uh, LINE for uh, uh, short, in short. Um, so what it does is you have your model, you train your model, so once you train your model, you have a set of predictions. And then let's say you, for a particular patient, you wanna see, for a particular subject, you wanna see how your model, which features your model was using to classify that particular uh, subject. So uh, what you do, what Lime does um, behind, when you use Lime, what it does is like it perturbs uh, the, the input or the features in, in a local. Uh, so, so every subject has a set of features, right? For each feature, every subject has a value. 
So you perturb the, the feature space around uh, locally for that particular subject. And then you see how much your prediction is changing for that particular subject. And depending on which, depending how far uh, each of your um, perturb instance is from the actual data, you're gonna wait your, um, you're gonna wait each uh, perturbation depending on how far they are from the original point and how much this affects each uh, the prediction for that particular subject. So in that way, you can see when you affect a particular variable, uh, which is the, the variable or feature, you can identify what is the feature that gives you like, um, that, that um, changes your prediction the most. So in that case, you can at the end, so when you do the, when you uh, perturb this input, feature space, then you can see how your prediction changed and you can determine by changing which uh, input features the most, your prediction changed the most. So in that case, you can identify which are the input features that are driving that particular decision. Um, so yeah, so I think that's, that's it. Awesome, thanks, Steph. Uh, I guess we'll take a couple of questions and then mm -hmm. we'll have a break before the workshop. Mm -hmm. um, there was one that was asked a little bit earlier mm -hmm. um, during the classification. Uh, so we were saying this is for classific. Uh, what you were showing is, was for classification of two classes, but mm -hmm. is the score function for more than two classes? Can we weight the model so that we reduce specific parts of the confusion matrix for these tasks? Can we, uh, sorry, can you repeat the question? Can we weight the model? I guess that's kind of like a two part question. One is, I guess, what do you do when you have multiple classes? Like how does the score function work when you have multiple classes? And then whether you can weight the model um, so that you can reduce specific parts of the confusion matrix for these tasks. I see. Okay, so, so this confusion matrix is, um, is for the, um, Sorry, these, these specific uh, measures or score functions here are for a binary uh, problem, right? But then when you have a multiple, let's bring this one here. Okay. Now you can think when you have a multi-class uh, classification problem, you can think of each class as a binary classification. So whether you predict it as a cut or as something else, right? So once you can see each class as a binary classification problem, you can basically apply any of these, of these measures. And then, but that, but then that gives you like a performance of your model for each class specifically, right? But then if you want to have an, uh, an overall like uh, pre uh, prediction performance of your model, what you can do is you can average or uh, yeah, average ac across classes uh, like any of these, of these uh, measures. Is that clear? I think, I think the question was more like if it's really important for me to this to uh, well classify cats versus dogs, but not that much uh, for another animal, for instance, uh, can I tweak uh, things such that see, my model is uh, like, uh, so I don't really care about the birds. I mean, uh, you know, if they are misclassified, that's okay. But I really care about the cats and dogs. Uh, so I think, uh, I, think the, I understood the question as, uh, can we uh, tweak the, uh, the, uh, the uh, maybe the, the, you know, how do we tweak our models such that, you know, we favor some, uh, some specific classes? I see, I see. So that's the second, yeah, that's the second part of the question. So, um, I mean, the, the, the answer that comes to my mind like right away is if we think, for example, of um, probabilistic classifiers where you have rather than your classifier telling you this particular data point belongs to this class, it gives you a, a probability distribution uh, to each of the classes, right? So you have a, pro a, a, a probability of each data point belonging to a different um, class. So what you do in those cases, uh, if you're, so that's the advantage of using probabilistic classifiers is that you can use these two curves here. So basically each, 
Uh, this is a parametric curve in, uh, as a function of the threshold that you're using. So basically, uh, you can play with that threshold to either reduce your, your, tip, your um, true positive rate or your false positive rate, which it depends. Sometimes you're interested in, um, in weighting one more than the other, right? So you can play, that's exactly why these curves are important because this allows you to determine which threshold you can choose better such that you have uh, one, uh, one over the other. You can prefer one over the other. I don't know if that uh, maybe better answers the, the question. I suppose you can also play with the loss function and uh, and define the fact that you know like the loss function maybe uh, tweak such that uh, it will uh, re reflect some more importance for some uh, differences versus others. Yeah, yeah, I guess uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Oh well, yes, but isn't sensitivity and specificity only for two class prop? Okay, no, he's got it. okay. Uh, um, and then we have another question: um, Would you trust the coefficients? using the top predictors that come from bridge or lasso regression, for example, uh, which is similar to statistical inference procedures? Um, I guess the question is, would you trust the coefficients um, from ridge and lasso regression? As, as, to, as for like to do a statistical inference? Yes. I, I don't have an answer of why you should not do that but I do remember reading somewhere that you should not, when you apply a type of, um, of regularization, is not, uh, is not good to do a statistical inference when you do that. That the reason why you should not do that. Um, so there's, there's a nice paper on this. It's, it, 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 they're backwards regression techniques. Um, so the idea is that if you could if you might have a really, really, um, you know, high a feature with, with that seems like it's very important, it has a high coefficient, but maybe you take out that feature. What will happen is the model will kind of you'll refit the model, and then what may happen is that another feature that may have been collinear uh, will then become very important all of a sudden, um, which and that feature previously wasn't very important, and because of the re uh, regularization process, um, features that are collinear will arbitrarily be. Uh, reduced or, or increased. So it's, it's so you can't really trust what's going on. Really the purpose is what gets me the maximal prediction. It doesn't really care how it gets there. Okay. Yep, that's correct. Uh, there are techniques to actually uh, estimate the importance of feature. Uh, that's, uh, you know, this, uh, so those are, yeah, there are techniques to do that. Exactly as, as Jake described, you could, you know, like, uh, you're basically removing uh, one or, se or set of features and uh, to estimate how, how those features are important in the prediction. Mm 